Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we can talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. You're listening to Jams and Tea. Look like fucking Baphomet. <laughs> <laughs> And on the note of looking like Baphomet, welcome everyone to a new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea and occasionally look like Baphomet. And on this this week, we have we have plenty to talk about, but on this oh, no. particular, uh, on the main set of episodes, we are going to be talking about not three records today, but four, actually, because August's recommended albums for the Record Club listen this week were a double listen of the Rolling Stones' Exile on Main Street and Liz Fair's response to said album in Exile on Guyville. And that is going to be uploaded in a separate episode later on the day that we upload this, but... Watch it. It was really good. Core, yes, the core episode <laughs> today is going to be on the new Killers album, which is called something... Uh, imploding, imploding the... Around. Exploding... <laughs> Mirages. No, no, no. Im- imploding uh, the mirage. Imploding Very the distinction. the the mirage. That's the which one. Is a and title. Then there's the new Bright Eyes okay. album, which is again another fucking title, which I, I hit- can't be fucking at. Connor, name, weeds, name name your fucking world albums world better. Could could you imagine like, just like you finished over... tracking your rec- just I want, you're in LA and you just finished tracking your record you're about to send it off for mastering and and your producer asks you so Brandon Flowers what what do I call your record and he goes oh man I want to call it imploding the mirage and then everyone says good idea what universe did that happen in? look it's a better look. album title than wonderful wonderful it's true that <laughs> is is album. true I'd also which like was, to point out which that which was shit shit. <laughs> my favorite my favorite bright eyes album is uh casadega not because the music is good but because it's the only title that's easy to remember and is less than 15 words connor <laughs> anyway what's the album called jake what's the bright eyes album called it's called punisher no down in the weeds <laughs> you got it so shit. yeah that's, a, that's the one it. that's the one it. And Another uh, but today obnoxious album title. we are going to talk about the records that we have been listening to this week to start off things. Oh my god. And so, I was let's... thinking that since last week we did we went Morgan, Sergio, Tyler, Jake, August, let's do the reverse of that this week and August oh. can go first. Oh shit. Just okay, so you. Let's go. What I listened to this week. First, Autucker, Confield. I've kind of started to dive deeper into this album. Uh, I quite enjoy it a lot. I don't know if it's my favorite Autucker record, but it's definitely in close, con- te- in close contest for it. Second album, uh, Twilight Sad, uh, their first one, 14 Autumns, 15 Winters. I liked it. It's, uh, it's a decent album. It's got some uh, really nice aesthetics to it. Stand By Me song on it is by far and away my favorite song on that album. And considering I also listened to their other, uh, their most recent album, uh, oh, yeah. It Won't Be Like This All The Time or something. Yeah, Perfect. that's it. Nailed it. Uh, that is probably my favorite song I've heard from them. It Won't Be Like This All The Time, though. I found it kind of lyrically overbearing and a little obnoxious to listen to. Okay. But, uh, okay. <laughs> And just like, I'm not even... looking like Jim Carrey. We don't have the time to unpack that now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, moving swiftly along, Bjork, Medulla, awesome album. Uh, Yay! I don't know. It's it's only the second Bjork album I've heard, but uh, she's been pretty consistent from what I've heard. Final album, Mezzanine by Massive Attack. Very uh, fantastic, classic trip hop album. I love love it to death. I uh, wrote about it in English class, and uh, now my English teacher's going to have to read about that album. So, Sick. results on that That's next cool. week. And I will. I, am, I want to follow this saga. One quick note, though. This is just a funny incident I need to mention. Um, in uh, in my in another online class, I recommended to the teacher before class started. He play. No Reptiles by Everything Everything. 
He stopped it halfway through and said to me, August, you have weird taste in music. And I said, you just figured that out now. That's my wish. <laughs> and if he, th- if he thinks no... If he thinks no reptiles is weird, we have some some stuff for him. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I thought August was going to say, was going to tell him to play like liturgy's Ketzel Codal or something. Yeah. <laughs> we have dad to to like, yeah, I was going to say though, Go August's dad did, is now a fan of the artwork. <laughs> what, what constitutes a fan of the artwork? artwork? <laughs> uh, we a did an entire of... podcast about it and I couldn't fucking tell you. Exactly. A rating above four. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's, a, it's a great album listen to it watch our video where we um went kind yeah, of insane do that. anyways jake go ahead oh yeah oh and speaking of watching our videos my tom waits worst to best is out right now go and view that i, I good. did that thank you um uh and of course i listened to tom waits album this week but i'm not going to talk about those because i did plenty of that in the video uh also my marvel poster is now gone that, that, that aspect of this podcast is eliminated, and now it's Rush, so yeah. it's more indicative of me. Um, but this week, I listened to a lot of records. Uh, one of my favorites uh, of this week is I've been delving into the discography of one Miss PJ Harvey, which I am um, long overdue. Don't know why I haven't done it yet. Uh, but I listened to um, White Chalk, Rid of Me, and To Bring You My Love. And of my, like, I liked all three quite a bit, uh, but To Bring You My Love is my favorite of hers. It is really loud, raucous, pure, punky kind of energy, not punk rock, but the actual like explosivity of the sound. It's very like, it's just so energetic and PJ's got these really theatrical, animated, sort of like tough kind of vocal performances on it. And I mean, To Bring You My Love is just an album about being like, just just really horny. And I, I feel it pj and she she and you know she talks about you know fucking god and you know what i i it's like thankful. violently horny though like, that's the thing yes with pj's 90s era is that it's like mm-hmm. i want to rip your head off and fuck it like yeah that's it. and that's I awesome will rip, i will rip your head off and skull fuck you sorry <laughs> that's um, that, so that's you that's, that's probably wants to uh you could say she wants to uh fuck you until your dick is blue uh, hey, uh, hey. like the song mm, like yeah, the song but but, but yes but none uh, of great album uh, it's it's being reissued on vinyl and i pre-ordered that shit immediately that is out in september so go do that and speaking there of vinyl go. and building off of august uh listen to the twilight sad i finally listened to uh another twilight sad album because i have been enamored with uh 14 autumns and 15 winters ever since i heard it and it has become <laughs> one of I can't wait to watch that back a million times. (laughs) I only got a glimpse of it, so I'm excited. I want to make a gif out of it. But uh, I listened to Tyler's noted favorite of the Twilight Sads just because I was trying to to finally work my way into... Did you just call them them the Twilight Sads? Yeah, sure. I don't know. Uh, But I got... I'll give you something. I'll say say one thing. Love this band to death. Maybe my favorite working band today. Awful band name. Really bad band name. Eh, I'm, okay. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I've heard but I love them. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, as you may have guessed, I really like this album. It's very good because let me just say, 14 Autumns, 15 Winners is like shot up. This is a like top 30 album for me now. I love it. This is better. I, you're uh, right. Uh, when, you're right. You're right. And you're just right. And it's so like it's just like it's one of the most perfectly produced albums I've ever heard. It's a little bit more post punky than the last album. Still kind of has like a shoegazy sort of edge to it, but just the <sighs> vibe here is so strong, and the like just everything is at full force. The songwriting is great. The vocals are somehow even better, and it's just like this is the most ascent. Like this is the intersection of Tyler and Jake core, like purely in its most raw form. Yeah. Um, I will... to shit on it next week. Oh, it'll be great. Um, I will say I, um, I, I will put off my thoughts on Bright Eyes just because we're going to talk about one of those albums today, so I'm sure that will pop up. But I finally got around to listening into its entirety, uh, Miles by Blue and Exile, 
uh, after listening to their earlier project, uh, Beneath the Heavens, which is amazing, and you should all listen to that because it's one of the best jazz rap albums I've ever heard. And uh, Miles is also fantastic, not as good, and it's a little long. It's 90 minutes, which is why it took me so long to get to it. But it has stellar moments. I'd say it's up there in terms of like the projects of like the big sort of throwback hip hop albums that are just sort of these epics like Forever is a Mighty Long Time by Big Crit or To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar. This is in that vein and you owe it to yourself to give it a listen. It has the best song of the year so far on it until it becomes the worst song on the album halfway through with a spoken word piece that lasts way too long. But beside the point, um, I listened or I re-listened to, um, well, actually I'll skip that. Uh, I listened to my first Peter Gabriel album. I listened to Melt, Peter Gabriel 3. That album's fucking amazing. It's so, so good. So good. Like, I love the weird kind of industrial tinge the sound has. The opening track is just this slimy, filthy, creepy song about, like, you know, being a, a fucking, like, voyeur who breaks into people's houses and watches them sleep. It's just like, damn, Peter, are you going through some shit? Um, it's so funny, and, like, when you think of Peter Gabriel, you think of, like, Sledgehammer, but his first yeah. two albums are, like, just completely it's nothing like that. Weird as fuck, and I love it. Um, I did listen to uh, Confield as well. Um, I love it, but that's sort of an album that I feel um, is difficult to talk about, so I won't try to do it justice mm -hmm. and say that you just have to listen to it. But the last thing mm. I'll talk about is I listened to the self-titled of a one Mr. David Gilmore of Pink Floyd, uh, just because I've been meaning to. Um, it is an hour of really, really competent guitar wankery that's very, very boring. And it has three truly exceptional songs on it that sound just like it was plucked out of the wall era Pink Floyd. And the rest of the album is fine. That sure sounds, sounds like, like 80s Pink Floyd to me. Yeah, I was going to say yep. that sounds like every Floyd F post Rogers. Post yeah, final post cut. Rogers. It, yeah, it's like all, all the parts Roger about the Waters. final cuts that were in. It's, yeah, yeah, it's that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Very good. All right. Uh, I guess that's me next. Um, Indeed. All right. So uh, I listened to uh, Emmy Lou Harris's album, Wrecking Ball. Um, so Emily Harris is a country music artist um, and she teamed up with Daniel Lenoy, who I think produced a lot of the sort of late 80s albums of, of U2 with Brian Eno. And so what the result is, is Wrecking Ball is a very kind of sad album with very atmospheric and rich production. Uh, there's some really just devastating songs on this record. It's incredibly sad, like jake and morgan would love it if you haven't heard it it's very i love that that's immediately where you'd go to it's well, like, like it's, it's sad jake it, and morgan would love it's it. sad old country so like well, yeah i mean that, yeah it's it's emmy lou harris exactly so. exactly so it's, it was an amazing album yeah so i, I can't recommend it enough um i also what was the album called again it's called wrecking ball wrecking ball okay uh, in like a no. Don't do this no. to her. This album came out in 1995, all right? I know. Miley Cyrus okay. wasn't even a fucking sperm then. She probably was born. But even I, I think so, yeah. Ooh. Boy, she born to do another man's bidding. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I wow. also I also listened to an amazing record that I uh, is beloved online, but I somehow only just got to. Tim Buckley's Star Sailor. Yeah! <laughs> Uh, which is just, I thought Tim Buckley, like I, Jeff Buck, we all know Jeff Buckley, right? You know, yes. fantastic song. No, no, never no heard tell him. me again. Gone, <laughs> gone, <laughs> gone too soon. But like, and so I thought Tim Buckley is his dad. I know he's a musician. <laughs> I presume it's just like similar kind of folky music, maybe some kind of Van Morrison-y stuff from the late 60s, early 70s. Boy, was I wrong. This very, album very wrong. is fucking insane. It's like the meeting point of, what did I say on, on Twitter? It's the meeting Trout point Mask of, like, Replica and uh, something else. It's the meeting point of Trout Mask Replica and late period Scott Walker. Uh, yeah, that's it. It's, it's really out there, strange, but like it's more tethered than either of those two artists are. So it's kind of easier to just vibe with it. And it's only 35 minutes as well, so it's really short. Yep. Uh, but it's just so powerful. It's like so brilliant and just 
weird and, and it throws you off from the from the beginning but by the end of the record you're really kind of grooving with it it's strange it's beguiling it's unlike anything else i've heard like, even those comparisons are kind of weak because i don't really capture the unique uh, alchemy that 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 tim kind of manages to conjure uh with the way he combines sounds on this album really amazing stuff uh highly recommend that's probably the best album i listened to for the first time this week uh, I also listened to, though, almost as good uh, and really kind of completely unrelated, but still a great album, uh, Tom Waits' Real Gone, uh, which I know is a big pod uh, album for at least two people here. So I want to say that I want to echo the sentiment that it's great uh, and that it is uh, much like, uh, much, oh, I guess it's not really like Injustice for All, but I keep thinking about it in the sense that the the records that have production styles that are very controversial and widely disliked by certain people, but that I think uh, when you listen to remastered versions and those are kind of dialed back, it takes a lot of the effect away. So I like the original. Understandable take. I like the original mix mm. of Real Gone considerably. I more knew you than would. The, than the remix, <laughs> even though it does, I mean, quantifiably, like in terms of, of, of whatever approaches, you know, generally agreed objective music criticism it sounds bad but it like it works for, <laughs> it, for the songs it, it, it's for what, just a matter of preference really what I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, like it, it does sound kind of bad like it's compressed yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and yeah it's but it, like it does work in service of the kind of claustrophobic it achieves the vibe yeah and it and tom just completely sells it like it's it's an amazing album so good so good i can't wait to spend more time with it uh <laughs> Uh, what else did I listen to? Not a whole heck of a lot else. I did listen to uh, a couple of Chelsea Wolf albums, uh, oh. which I enjoyed. Uh, I listened Yay. to uh, Pain is Beauty, which I really, really liked. Uh, I thought it started off phenomenally and ended phenomenally. A bit weak in the midsection, unfortunately. But there's, the highlights on this album are just... Really? Final three tracks, man. That's yeah. that's as good as it gets. Yeah, yeah. That that like that last that seven minute song. I can't remember what it's called. Um, the big song on that album at the end. Uh, that's not. Fucking have gone. What the fuck is it called? Whatever it was. It. The big Don't one, worry. anyway. The one that everyone loves. It's like uh, easily the best song I've heard from her so far. Really good. I look forward to. I'll listen to. I'm gonna listen to a best in the rest. The of waves have soon. come. Yeah, that one. The waves have come. I did also listen to her uh, acoustic record, Unknown Rooms, as well, uh, which I thought was very nice. Um, uh, the opening yes. track on that as well, like, again, I've forgotten the name, but the opening track Flatland. is just... Flatlands. Flatlands, yeah. That's just a fucking stellar song. Um, Maybe her best. Uh, uh, yeah, totally. Uh, uh, I could see that staying in my top ten by the time I heard all her stuff. Amazing song. Uh, I also listened to... Uh, how many records have I said so far? I think I've said four. Four. Okay, one more. Uh, and that will be uh, Blue Bell Knoll by Cocteau Twins, which I listened to. Uh, it's so great. great. Uh, I think yep. the thing about Cocteau Twins is it can be easy to kind of like overlook how rich their records are the first time you hear them. Yep. Uh, and I felt myself kind of while I was doing other things kind of slipping into that. But then with this album, but then I would kind of like focus my attention again. And every single time that happened, I was like, holy shit, there's so much great happening here. So I have to go back and listen to it again because uh, it's such a rich and fantastic record. One of their best for sure. Uh, and yeah, that's basically the highlights of my week in terms of new listens. Okay. Um, no shit. Cool. Um, right. So um, I'm. I li- I'm going to treat this as one slot, but um, I listened to a couple of Matt Elliott records this week. As did I. Um, yeah. Um, because obviously, like my vinyl of drinking songs came, that was and I love one. it. It's, yes. Um, Great album. But I, I also listened to Howling Songs and his 2020 release, uh, A Farewell to All We Know. Um, so and I, was just, I yeah, really like that one. Um, Howling yep. Songs, is, it does not have the apocalyptic tone of um, Drinking Songs, but I would say about A Farewell to All We Know. It, it is really stripped back, even more than Howling Songs. Um, I thought of like sort of Suzanne era Leonard Cohen a lot listening to it and he's obviously channeling Leonard with the vocal inflections. I really like it quite a bit. It's a solid mood piece. 
Um, what else did I listen to this week? I listened to The Mollusk by Ween. Hey! Um, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, it was really fun. So much fun. It's like When I get recommended records by this pod, I don't always expect them. I, I expect sometimes, like, it's going to be obtuse and strange, but my God, the mollusk is such a good time. <laughs> like, oh my God. Um, the Ocean Man is two minutes of concentrated joy in, in audio form. Yeah, um, and also, I, let's not forget, I always keep coming back to the fact that that record has a full blown fucking sea shanty on it and it sounds amazing. Yeah. Oh my god, and they—they they have, and it, it's all like in character, and they're like, uh, "I'm gonna get this maiden, we're gonna fuck," and it's just like, okay. Um. <laughs> Do love me a good sea shanty. Abs- yes, um, I listen that to rag. What is that rag? What is that rag? Like, That's what it sounds like. He's like really I'm gonna take so the so much. sins of my father. I'm gonna t- sorry. I, I don't think it's Tom Waits' cover minutes. album will be That's... released this fall. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever heard a Tom Waits impression that sounds less like him. <laughs> <laughs> With respect. <laughs> No, that's absolutely fair enough. I just, Which I don't. It's a good thing because it means it means so sure that you have a pleasant voice. <laughs> I also listened yep. to the Money Store by Death Grips today uh, this week. Oh, speaking um, of pleasant voices, <laughs> oh, I say fudge. <laughs> I say get, 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 get. I've got the fame. Oh, that's, that's enough of that. Falling out of two. <laughs> Coming out my mouth. This is going to be a good episode, I can tell. Um, <laughs> I'm in your area. <laughs> okay, stop me. okay, it was my second death. Threat. My first was ex-military. Uh, I didn't mean to go in chronological order, but apparently I did. Um, and I, I loved ex-military, but this is like an entirely different beast. Um, it's way please, more spacey. You must be smoking rocks. Sorry. Enough of that. We already said <laughs> It's way more elegiac in places, actually. Like, I would, you would not, you would not hear the synth lead and get got on X Military. Um, no, and it, it means, yeah, and they both had this just wonderful different character to them. So, okay, so that's like three records. I have two left. Um, mm, I'm gonna make a choice. Okay, I listened to Boy Genius EP. I thought it yes. was fucking amazing. I already knew some of the songs off of it, but um. Wow, just uh, Sir Sharon and energy, women. <laughs> that's yeah, that's my review. Women, yeah. women. Um, and I also listened to their existing addiction to blood for because so did I. It's related to future jams and yes. Well, I mean, it's no yep. secret that they're releasing a new album in October. Oh, that that yep. wasn't what and I was it has to. identical album cover. I know, I know. Not I identical. Referring the to... original has, yeah. Yeah. Like blood has nails and the new one has teeth on it. Yes, but clearly a parallel. They were initially... They but were that originally... wasn't what I was referring to with the future Jams and Tea content ah, to which I, I was referring. Oh, right. Yeah. Forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you just can't get the help these days. This is what I have to deal with, audience. Anyway, um... <laughs> I'm good. I'm done. Let's move on. Morgan. Oh, let Morgan say what he has to say. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't. I don't have to say a whole lot because, frankly, I was just trying to get through uh, this week's releases and give them the proper time of day. Because uh, I, w- I wanted to listen to the our double bill once uh, with each album, just normally. Yep. So that's two already. And then with the playlist I made with uh, one alternating back and forth between the songs. So that took up a lot of my, uh, no, my listening that, that uh, this week. Fair. So uh, that said, it's uh, funny that Jake and I both listened to Peter Gabriel, but there's like a, huh? I feel like the odds of that happening just because we are who we are, are, are fairly high anyway. That's true, that's um, true. I listened to uh, his first solo album, which 
I liked quite a bit. Um, there's, I feel like there's evidently some growing pains on there, but it's it's clear even from then that Gabriel's a genius. Um, like you can't, you can't beat Salisbury Hill. Yeah, exactly. you can't. You can't. You can't do it. Except that he maybe does it on <laughs> like the last song <laughs> on the album. For for what it's worth, I think that uh, Car, the first one that you listen to, is the weakest of the four self-titled ones. But I don't know that that's the general consensus. But I think that he gets better uh, as he goes on. Um, Security, especially the fourth self-titled one, is super underrated. And so is Scratch as well, the second one. But yeah, I digress. Good artist. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the impression I've gotten, is that they kind of just get better as they go along as he's starting out. But so is one of my f- like five favorite albums from the eighties and has like three of my favorite songs full stop. So I was like, I should probably do a little more for this guy than Genesis, which is just not my bag from if, if, the looks if, of things. You still, I still maintain you should listen to selling England by the pound. That I, is, I, I should, is, and is, is I will song writing on it. I should, and I will. But yeah, um, granted. It's like me when people say I should listen to Shushu. I just I know that I will like them and I will listen to them, but I can't tell you when. That's fair. Yeah. Just do and, it. And uh, really, really, the only uh, notable th- other thing that I listened to this week is what we're uh, covering next week, which is the new Rustin Kelly album. Yep, I did Shape too. And destroy. Um, and I uh, yeah. I obviously can't get it. God damn. Oh. Well, no, what? No, I haven't heard it. I'm not like being snarky. Oh, okay. I was just trying okay. to like say, don't say anything about it, but you already kind of yeah. weren't, weren't going to. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm all, I will say for now. That it's a 10. N- no. Um, well, now I we know it's say- con- confirmed, not a 10. <laughs> damn. <laughs> we don't. We don't actually, because I've only listened to it once. Same. And things may change a week from now. All right. But all I would say is that, that right now, I am not disappointed. It's good to see R. Kelly, R. Kelly releasing new. new Shut music. the fuck up. <laughs> Shut up. So Tyler oh, antagonizes no. Morgan so hard that he stole a joke from Sersha's brain and made it. It was such a mean joke. I'm so oh, proud of you. Look, on the, look, on the net of artists I, not disappointing I was not, us, let's I, talk about him floating the mirage. No, 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 look, 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 look. I just want to say I did not say that to antagonize Morgan. I said it to get it out of the way so it didn't have to be said next week when we review sure, it. That's a likely story. Likely story. Yeah, I, I see he's a Already kind of upset. He's gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so let's talk about exploding the marriage. Um, <laughs> exploding the marriage is the alternate title for us to get his new album. Oh I just no! Needed, oh, I, just, God, I, just, I just needed person. to make to make this right. Oh this God, song. I'm gonna go to hell! Oh, oh no! Did you what he just did? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to hell. Uh, <laughs> that was worse than Tyler's. So, yeah, his wife the Mirage is uh, the new Killers album. It's pretty good. I'd give it an 8 out of 10. Get out you of it, dude. Let's talk no about why such trash. fucking thing. Ah, this album has got me feeling well, emotions. We should, we should introduce it. We need to introduce it. Uh, this is the Killers. I mean, what fucking album are they even on at this point? This like, is like their is this? Se- seventh, seventh, I, eighth, something I, like that. I, I, believe, I believe this is their sixth album. Oh, sixth, or sixth, or sixth, as sixth. I like to think of it, this is their uh, latest album since Hot Fuss. Yeah, um, that's again, true. it's the latest album since I mean, Hot Fuss, but for the fifth time. Yeah, it's no secret that like the Killers were really, really big because of Hot Fuss being, like, just containing almost exclusively infinitely replayable radio hits that Absolutely. still get airplay today. And I don't know if, like, I don't know if there's going to be any dissenting opinions on Hot Fuss, but I think Hot Fuss fucking rules. But 
Yeah. Hot uh, Fuss ever is since a then, album. so yeah. does Richard Kelly, ev- apparently. Ev- yes. And ever <laughs> since Hot Fuss, the Killers have completely failed to grab people's attention the way they had on that oh, record. You're being too way too harsh. They've had plenty of successful singles since then. Sam's Town. Singles. Oh, I mean albums. Well, Sam's Town was a successful album, and it's a good album too. But I, can't believe, but... I, I can't believe I'm going to be defending the fucking Killers today. No, 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 hang on, hang on. Let's clear something up. Every single Killers album has been successful. All of yeah. them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. But do you hear any of them talked about like you do Hot Fuss? No, that's, that's, that's no, not no, but like, point. it's like, it's not point. what I'm getting at. It's, it's, like, it's not it's, what it's, I was it's, getting at. I was just yeah. making that guys, point. Guys, 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 <laughs> on any album after Hot Fuss, do you hear as many like album tracks celebrated outside of the context of the album? That's what I'm saying. No, but that's not like. And why didn't you say that? That's not like a negative thing. Like I, th- I think of it like Interpol. Like uh, Hot Fuss is their turn on the bright lights. Sam's Town is their antics. Um, basically, this a very similar kind of trajectory. Where if you're a fan, then you're gonna enjoy the sound as it progresses from album to album. But if you're kind of you know interested in in like serious development or you know, then you're probably gonna jump ship pretty quickly. Um, but I. I, I do vibe with the killers and like I am definitely I, I think the only album there's two albums of these that don't work for me that much, which is Day and Age and Wonderful Wonderful. I am reluctantly to say I am a, a bit of a battleborn uh apologist. Oh. I don't think it's a very great album or anything. I think mm. it's fine, but it just fi- I, it has some endearing qualities mm. to me that I, 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 I remember. Enjoy. I remember the Battleborn hadn't come out, and th- th- those were in the days where I still cared about Jules Holland. Um, <laughs> and like, I I tuned into the episode where the Killers were playing tracks from Battleborn before any songs had been released, and the feeling of dread I felt in my stomach when the actual songs started playing. Well, one, one like, thing. Like, Mr. Atomic Bomb has grown on me, but outside of that, I'm a bit. Well, like, one thing I will say is that the Killers are an absolutely terrible live act, so that may color your impressions <laughs> of those songs. But, true, but, true. and Battleborn is not a great album. It, it, is, it does have a lot of weaknesses on it, and it's not, it is, you know, very kind of like corny. Like, but it reminded me of like the first time I heard like Meatloaf, for example. Like, it just has that same kind of like unabashed, kind of over the top, uh, winnable <laughs> charm to it. And, um, <laughs> I, I know because I've been getting the vibes all week that, um, <laughs> that this new album is not exactly like people's uh, cup of tea, and I get that. <laughs> I certainly think that it's basically for me. I sit with the new album the same way I sit with Battleborn, where I'm like, no, this isn't a great album. It's not even like a very good album, but I like it. It's endearing. Uh, they kind of have a, their heart on their sleeve, and there's just. What really wins it for me, I think this is actually maybe even narrowly better than Battleborn because it just has higher highs than that record does have. And I think what wins it for me is that there's just total, complete uh, commitment. They've never sold out. It's just that they, they're doing the music they want to do. And you can and that doesn't necessarily make it good, but what it does make it feel is authentic, even if it is like very heavily like derivative of, of like other artists like Springsteen. And on this album, I think even more um, presciently, The War on Drugs, especially their album, A Deeper mm. Understanding, which basically this is just doing that album, but not as great as that album is. Mm-hmm. Uh, that said, uh, and I look, Look, I'm going to, I said to Jake that I'm going to um, do a, a lukewarm defense of this album because I do think that it has some pretty major flaws. Like just generally the songwriting is not consistent. I will say though, first four songs, I really like uh, opening song, uh, My Own Soul's Warning, I think is amazing. I love that song. It's <laughs> one of their best songs ever. It's just yeah, it's, like, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, it is. It's really good. Like, and I'm not going to pretend for a second that it's like original or that it sounds like a reinvented band, but it just, it just has so much energy and passion and just a really great beat and like a really great melody that sounds like obviously really classic and, and, and like, I think basically they've ripped it from that one song on A Deeper Understanding. Uh, I think it's like Holding On or Pain or one of those early songs that sounds basically the same as this. But they're doing it really, really, really well. And they're doing it re- with a lot of conviction. And and there's just so much passion in Brandon's vocal performances on these early tracks, first four tracks especially. Like um, the other one that really stands out to me is Caution as well, which I just think is really corny, but at the same time, really kind of... Uh, oh, so good though. 
Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's a lot of fun, and it really kind of you know I just I put it on and I can just vibe with it, and it it just takes me like to this you know dreamland, like this kind of fantastical, unrealistic place where kind of everything is is beautiful for a short period of time. And it is like you know I'm not going to make an argument that it's like you know a new watermark or something, but it's just fine. It's good. And I also like um, the the track that Wise Blood features on. My God, I think is a really good song. I don't think it's as good as uh, the first four songs, but I do quite like that track as well. That said, uh, there are a lot of low points on this record, songs that just don't really work, like uh, Lightning Fields, which I think- That was the first one that came to mind. A big dud, honestly don't care for it uh running towards a place uh i listened to this album twice i still don't remember a damn thing about that song uh and i know you're gonna say well i don't remember a thing about any of these songs but like <laughs> oh no i well first of all thank you for the praise of mocking roasted well, all of you <laughs> look look that, look i'm not gonna you know pretend that because snore. i like the album it doesn't have bad songs <laughs> running towards a place is a dud uh, the closing track especially just ends the record on a really weak note, I think. Just just really, the title track just really falls flat for me. I, I do like When the Dreams Run Dry. Uh, I think that's kind of uh, sweet. And um, again, it has that kind of passion. And it, it, it kind of carry it. Even though they're not going to win a fucking Pulitzer for the writing, it's still, you know, it's still kind of, the music does it, what it says on the tin. And most importantly, it sounds good. Like the production is for the most part really good on this album. It sounds yeah. clear and it sounds, and it, I don't know, it's punchy. Uh, and the album's short, like it's 10 tracks, a tight 10 tracks, even though they're not all great, it doesn't outstay its welcome, like even the, even Battleborn does, um, and it's certainly like generally the pedigree of the songs here is, is considerably more consistent than it was on Wonderful Wonderful, which was just kind of like a soup of, of forgettable tripe. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm ready to hear about how it's boring and dull and I'm going to completely accept that because it's totally valid, obviously, but lukewarm defense. I do. I did have a fun time listening to this and uh, I would, re- I would still generally recommend it to people. So, yeah. If, lukewarm if I might, defense, like if I might follow. Morgan, you were saying you take cold baths. <laughs> yes. You weird bastard. Actually, no, I don't take baths. I um, take showers because I'm not a child. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you raise a great point there. Um, <laughs> that said, I am also going to offer a lukewarm defense of this record. Much as I have been offering a lukewarm defense of the killers since the entire time that they've been around, more or less... Um, excusing hot fuss, which is just a, a, a passionate defense, if yeah. it ever comes to that. But you know, the the one thing I can say about the Killers is there is at least one song on every album they have that I absolutely love. For, I'll go with that. I'll go with for that. hot fuss, it's like most of them. Uh, yeah. Sam Town, Sam's Town, it's Read My Mind and When You Were Young. Day and Age has Human. Uh, is Battleborn next? Battleborn's next. Uh, Battleborn has. Uh, Miss Atomic Bomb and Here With Me. Uh, the last one has Run For Cover. And uh, this one has uh, Caution and My Own Soul's Warning, which are just... Look, I, I, I'm, I've i made it a point on this podcast that... And I've never really gotten the chance to go into this, but I've made it a point that I'm a fan of unashamedly cheesy, heart-on-sleeve, 80s new wave pop, heartland pop, whatever you want to call it. It's very much my brand. So, you know, automatically kind of this album's on my good side. Oh, especially with like Caution and My Own Soul's Warning and the uh, the track that Wise Blood is on. And honestly, I even kind of like Lightning Fields. I'm not going to tell you it's great or even good, uh, but I enjoy it for whatever it's worth. Um that said, there's just uh, large swaths, swaths words of this album that are uh, just really, really boring. It's just, just not all that impressive. Uh, 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 fucking, uh, what's the... Uh, I can't remember anything. 
that isn't those three <laughs> tracks. May I offer I can't remember fire anything and full bone? Stop. Yeah, fire that's a good, good one. Yeah, I like that Can one too. Not... Uh, oh no, that that was one I was gonna say was mid, and I didn't remember oh. it until Jake just said it. Oh. Exactly. Uh, I honestly don't like Dying Breed at all. No. It's it's. <laughs> eh. I grew on me the second time I listened to this, but yeah, I get it. Uh, running towards a place and the title track are just bleh. so that's already like half the album. Yeah, that's just like shit through a goose. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I I enjoy parts of it. They're, you know, it's just. The way that I would describe the killers from Hot Fuss onwards is like, like hold your fire rush through to test for Echo, but that's their whole career. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. Eh. And that's really the only feeling you get from any of them besides one or two really great songs. Just, eh, all right. So, I suppose yeah. that if you two are offering a lukewarm defense... I can oh, go into a lukewarm offense. Yeah. Well, honestly, oh, I just can't imagine yeah. anyone having passionate feelings well, about this album. I, I don't. Way. That's that's no, the no, no. thing. I know. I'm saying that you don't. Obviously, but, which is why I'm like, saying, like, of course. But I, I must follow up my point from earlier, in that before Tyler and Morgan jumped on my ass and then complained about me not saying the thing before they let me finish. Thank you. But. I do not deny that every Killers album since Hot Fuss has been some variation of successful. I'm just saying, when you hear a song on the radio or a song in a movie, that song is Mr. Brightside. That song is fucking, like, it's anything on that album. Mm -hmm. Anything from the rest of them, if you're going to argue with me that, that they have managed to maintain that level of zeitgeist about themselves, you're a liar. So this leads us into what even are the killers anymore? And apparently on this album, and I'm, I'll throw up my hands, I have only heard Hot Fuss and Sam's Town just because why would I delve into the discography of a band that nobody cares about? But I think... We, the, we do that like twice a week. Okay, I mean, in, but in the scheme the, the, of the bands point, generally that people either care or don't care about, like this is like generally a well-known and beloved band. This... This falls into a different category, right. though, of just like, oh, you know, Tyler gets into Ween, but the people who love Ween love it. They are emphatic. I have yet to find a person who does that with albums like sure. this. So yeah, if I can fair. move on to the actual record, problem here is that, well, problem El Numero Uno is that I don't like his vocal performances at all. Uh, I think they are strained and worn in a way that sounds inexperienced and unpolished and not at all befitting of this type of music. Bruce Springsteen is a great example of somebody who does that correctly. Here it sounds thin and unassured and just not what I like. think suits what they're going for in the slightest. Sometimes it works. Most of the time it doesn't. But... It also doesn't help that the entire album sounds like a Brian Fallon solo record if it was produced by Matt Berninger. And that sounds all well and good, but all of the lyrics August are not. <laughs> and I, it's- August, I know who those people are, and I'm just as confused as you. <laughs> Penny Sense, volume two. Okay, well, see, here's the thing, is that I feel, well, with the exception of the drums, which sound like shit, I think the production's pretty good. But it's very open, it's very, it is trying to to capture this more ethereal side of this music that I get when I listen to things like I Am Easy to Find or Sleep Well Beast, where it's like, ah, I get it, they're doing this thing, but with this slant, and I feel like that's what's happening here. And Brian Fallon is a person who owes his entire artistic career to Bruce Springsteen. So it seems like an apt comparison. So don't yell at me. But every single time... I can he start yelling head, at you. I'll come to your house <laughs> and whip your ass. Now, anyway, uh, I feel like it's just sort of impersonating other songs and acts that I've heard before, and it's just kind of tiresome when the lyrics feel uninspired. But I, I have to say, 
there is energy here. This is not a boring album. It's only boring if you take it within the context of music as a whole. In and of itself, I feel like they're making the music they want to make. This isn't a sellout album. I just don't think they're particularly good at this. What they're good at is really hooky, strong songwriting with a with the tongue firmly planted in cheek, something that gets stuck in your head, something that's anthemic, and I just do not find any of that appeal. All those descriptors the- are descriptors I would use for this album. And I want to just clarify something that I said, because I said that like I like it even though it's a... Um, uh, like you know pastiche and stuff and that it's very clearly mm-hmm. like derivative and stuff and i want to just clarify that like uh music is not i don't inherently like music that's derivative if it's just because it's and it's like authentic or like or like it's um they mean it that doesn't automatically make it good what does make this record good for me or, or at least like the songs are like good is that they have good hooks they have really strong melodies and really good vocal delivery uh, those three things are what make the songs that I like on this album. It's not just the fact that there is passion here. It's the fact that they're actually like, they lock into uh, a, a refined, um, you know, aspect of their sound that has kind of been lacking on, on some of their other records. For me, anyway, just to clarify. Well, I mean, that's, that's what will make or break this listening experience for you. It's just everything that Tyler found compelling about this, I didn't. I'm not saying that I think authenticity is inherently a good thing, just like any element of art, it can be good or bad, but I just don't think this feels like them playing dress up sound wise. This feels like they are trying to work out the kinks and at this far along in their career, I feel like they shouldn't sound like that. And this, this is also embodied by, I don't know if anybody else has looked at this, but Dying Breed song, not terrible, I suppose, have you looked at how many songwriting credits that song has? Because boy, let me tell you, this has this is written by Alex Cameron, Brandon Flowers, Holger Schuring, Urban Schmidt, Jake Liebzeit, Jonathan Rado, Kenji Suzuki, Klaus J. Dinger, Michael Caroli, Michael Rother, Mike Crossy. Now again, uh-huh. lots of songwriters doesn't always equal bad, but my problem here is that the tracks that came before this had at most two songwriters. And it feels really, really weird. And also just sort of attributes to the band's lyrics sounding like Vague Nothing, whereas on Hot Fuss, that is an album that is filled with weird anecdotes and personality and humor and all of these memorable, catchy things, whereas this is just, it's a breeze of vaguely pleasant sounding noise. Fair enough. Who would like to speak? <laughs> the air yeah. is dead. I mean, I thought it was just. Hello. Okay, so Ma'am? I, I, you said this isn't a boring record, and, and I, I want to heartily disagree. Um, and you are, you are right. This is a hard record to have strong feelings about. I don't. I have no feelings at all really about the music, but my experience listening to it was one of profound boredom. And I've listened to it like three times and I just wanted it to stop. Um, I I will say, Sersha, this does not surprise me considering that you are not a fan of uh, Bruce Springsteen who does this style of music better than any other person on the planet. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I've always said this about Bruce Springsteen. I don't necessarily vibe with his aesthetic or his vibe, but he is an extraordinarily talented songwriter. Um, And, you know, none of my sort of ill feelings about some of his aesthetic choices will take that away from him, you know? Um, and and I f- again, I, I feel like I'm just responding to things people have already said, but I wanted to say this from the beginning. It, I, Tyler said that people are gonna say that, oh, I don't remember any of it. I had in my notes where it's like, I, I will struggle to choose a favorite or least favorite track because it will feel like choosing corners of the, of the tri Rapati album cover. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Good one. I like the green corner. <laughs> <laughs> that face. <laughs> God, it's just, mm. and it's not like the album is bad. It's just so 
like it's not even that it's forgettable it's, it doesn't go in one ear and out the other it struggles to get in one ear because it, it, i just i can't begin to process it because i can't begin to engage with it because it's so watered down and really like there's no I, I, I can't feel like I can place a musical character to this album and I just need Brandon Flowers to realise he is not Bruce Springsteen and it's not an aesthetic that I think suits him and especially when he started off as like sad boy indie, indie lad child man baby person <laughs> just trying to adopt a Springsteen aesthetic after that is tedious and uh, just describe Brandon every- Flowers as Connor Oberst, funnily enough. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I don't know. When I think of who Brandon Flowers is, I think of like the music video from Mr. Brightside, where the joke is he just keeps getting cut. And it's like... <laughs> by by freaking Sal Maroney from The Dark Knight. <laughs> what is Mr. Brightside if not a song about being cucked? It absolutely is. Um, the generational <laughs> anthem. It's of, cuck- um, of cuckoldry. <laughs> um, Sam's Town was one of the first CDs I ever bought. I think that's a really good record, but I don't. But it does spell all of the problems that would become more pernicious in the later records. And I think, aside from their last one, there is a song on every one of their albums that I think is really fucking good. Um, but like Sam's Town, it has none of the coherence of Hot Fuss and the Heartland Rock influence is really there a lot um and you know i like a lot of heartland rock i just don't think brandon flowers is particularly good at it and he keeps trying uh and i I, like of course he's gonna have some good songs on on every record because it's like monkeys and typewriters and that's genuinely savage (laughs) stop clocking all that (laughs) Uh, I just, I, I feel, I don't understand why I'm so angry about a record I think is so bland and mediocre. Well, I mean, uh, it, we've been begging these guys since Hot Fuss, like 17 years ago, to be as good as they were then. Yeah. And it's just not happened. <laughs> nope. It's so true. It's so They showed true. so much promise. I know. But it's, it's because they've not played to their strengths at all. You're correct. Um, it's tragic in that respect because they clearly want to make this kind of music. They just aren't good at it. Yeah. Oh God. Like genuinely, all the things that I've done is one of the best songs of that decade. Like so I love. Ever. Yeah. Um, it's just so. It, it is. It makes Southland Tales worth watching. Like, uh, and and I just. No, sorry, Tyler. That's not, that's not going to be popular here. <laughs> I know. It's okay. I know, I'm not going to say it, a word. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. I already know what you think. It's fine. Um, and I'm sorry, but it's what it's how I feel. Um, and I'm I am angry at this record because I feel like it is wasting my time, and I have to re-listen to it. Um, and that I. I wish I had more to say, but I'm just mad at how boring it is. A completely acceptable stance, if you ask me. Yeah. All right. I, 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 get, I get the f- being the worst mid thing ever made. August. Yeah, I got. I, I get the feeling that August is going to be half as mad as you are, but twice as savage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. Uh, this is going to be a fucking Zuko, I'm never happy moment. Uh, my, my, my context with the killers is uh, they're fine. I think they're fine. Mr. Brightside is a fine song. I have no goddamn idea why it's got like 400 million views on YouTube or whatever Too young. it is. It's good. Probably. 2003 was just a really good landscape for that surely, kind of music surely that to was, popular. That wasn't 2003. Surely it was later than that. I think well, it was still, 2004 or five. Well, still, this is the same three-year span. It, they just were in a musical landscape where that kind of music was set to explode yeah. in some way or yeah. another. And August just missed the window. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so that being said, I have to ask about this album. Just, are we serious? 
Is this, is this really what it is? Is this really the album? <laughs> it, it just sounds like the most goddamn personality deficient, run of the mill, like anthemic pop rock sludge I've heard in a while. And, and I mean, it's not the worst of that kind of music to come out of this year. Lord knows Green Day set that far way too high for everyone else. But uh, yeah, my own soul's learning spends uh, most of its runtime uh, repeating the same annoying percussion line. I, uh, I, I don't care for uh, Brandon Flowers' voice on this album at all. I think Jake's made a good point about him just sounding awful. And, and we've that's, got this like... Um... It's a dumpster fire take. <laughs> well, well get in care. the dumpster fire and let him fucking talk. Yeah. Wee! You're the whining well, yeah, well, bitch. The the line about sucking on a TikTok tic tac on a sucking on back a is like <laughs> that that was Freudian something on that. Uh it 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 was the worst thing I've ever heard. And we're not even two songs into this album. Uh the, the songwriting is just trite as hell, like dying breed. Are we serious? That took like 700 people to write. I mean, if anything, that's a testament to the power of, of committees watering an idea down so much. Cameron, what? Yeah, it does, it does, like it does sound Cameron. like an Alex Cameron song. And in fairness, I would probably like it more if it were sung by him. Yeah, yeah so do I. a lot more. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I just, uh, God, production's fine, uh, but as Jake's mentioned, the drums are just, sound like overblown shit. Terrible. Uh, Caution's lead vocals are just reverbed to hell and back, and I can't get into that song at all. And yeah, the greatest crime here is that it's just a, a different sheen of, like, cliched vocals painted over just dry instrumental palettes that I didn't care for in the slightest. I mean, if anything, there's some cool guitar lines here and there. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, past this point, I'm checked out. The album just sucked so much nuts, but, but there are six goddamn songs left. And uh, I tried to write a joke for every song title, but I gave up after the first four, so I'll just give you the ones I have. Uh, my own soul's warning me not to listen to this album. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, below back, more like below me. Uh, dying breed, I hope you go extinct. I'm throwing <laughs> caution, throw me off a fucking cliff. <laughs> dying breed, I hope you go extinct sounds like the name of like a code orange song. Lightning <laughs> fields. I hope you get struck by lightning. Yeah. Um, imploding the marriage. No, they I write don't like it. Exploding. No, they do. <laughs> They're too easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, My so God reviews wet. itself. To be honest, like it does. <laughs> it's a good song. Come on. It's not that I'm bad. I, like I said, I got wise right on to it. pick out. I, I My God, this song is awful. Thing. On that note, actually, I think Katie Lang's feature on Lightning Fields is like, uh, I, I was in those like few seconds happy to be listening to the record. But, I mean, I, she, why is she listed as a feature there? I barely fucking heard anything from her on that goddamn song. I don't remember her. Oh, well, I mean, she's, she's, she's singing very she's, similarly to. to she's that. listed as a feature because she sings on it? Yeah, but like, People get people feature on songs all the time without being credited as a feature. Like you know, you hear like Beyonce at the end of a Frank Ocean song doesn't say featuring Beyonce, and that contributes way more to that song than she does here. It's just confusing. Yeah. But yeah, this, this album is uh, most certainly uh, when the dream run when the dreams run dry. <laughs> we gotta we gotta it's, stop. It's almost, it's almost like the killers have imploded the mirage of their quality. I was waiting yeah. for it. I was waiting That's, for it. I was waiting that was low hanging fruit. On that note, it was. We gotta stop yeah. reviewing fucking mid albums on this we show. We need a good. <laughs> we need some artists to release good records. 
Yeah, it's yeah. their fault, not ours. Exactly. It is. I mean, your year, that's not untrue. <laughs> we're, we're doing bands that people know and are listening to because, you know. And they suck. You all have <laughs> terrible taste. Even if Jake thinks that they're just ha- has beans, and he's probably right to an extent, but, you know. Why enough. are you looking at labeling that opinion like it's not totally common to think that? <laughs> Who the fuck gives a shit? <laughs> anyway, ex- excited to review the new Nas album next week. <laughs> Speaking of people wow. who no one in their right mind gives a shit about anymore. Okay, so let's yeah, do so... Uh, favorite tracks, least favorite tracks rating. At least, at least Brandon Flowers isn't an anti-vaxxer. That is As true. He's got that. He does have that going for him. At least I don't think he is. If he is, then I don't care. It's a shame he's a murderer. I fucking hate you so much. (laughs) (laughs) I thought you were going to dig up like a story, like a Matthew Broderick thing, where you find out that he actually literally killed a person and no one talks about it. And instead, you just made a shitty pun. These guys all all came together because they like... (laughs) kill the guy once and they, they were bonded for life and they decided to start a band it's like got a blood pact or something they just have to keep making out like they just put their heart and soul into hot fuss and then they're just like oh god we used all our talent what do we do now <laughs> Jake, what are it's you, like what they are you? signed a deal with the, with the devil it, it is almost the devil like, was like you're only going to be talented yeah. It is a monkey ball situation. It's like, I really want to make a great record. <laughs> you know what I feel is kind of funny is that, like, I think that Hot Fast is a pretty good album. I don't think it's a great album. I think it has a <laughs> kind of very front loaded, to be honest. But I, I, I can't say it's not their best, but I don't think it's like an amazing album. Oh my God. Anyway, Jake. Tracks, ratings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd say my three favorites are "My God, Caution" and "My Soul's Own My Own Soul's Warning." Uh, least favorite. <sighs> Honestly, I have to plant my contrarian flag in even tighter and say that I like both "Blowback" and "Dying Breed." I just don't care for it all, so I'll give them a, a tie, and uh, I'd give the album like a four point five. Mm-hmm. Nice August. Uh, favorites are uh, one. <laughs> I I'm not doing that because if I were to give a one, that would imply there would I would have ever in, that would imply I think the killers are ever my thing. But since since they're just never gonna be my thing, I'm not gonna be as harsh on it. Uh, favorite tracks are. Uh, my God, when dreams run dry and I'm clothing the mirage for no other reason than they're the last three songs. My least favorite is uh, a no dying breed, and uh, I'll give it a three. Yep. Okay. My my three favorites are caution, my own soul's warning, and my God. Same my, as me. My least favorite is Dying Breed, and my uh, my rating is uh, uh, Light 5. Okay, um, so my favorite tracks were The Man That Is Heard in the Trailer for Vice, um, The Killer's cover of Romeo and Juliet and Mr. Brightside, and my least favorite track is probably uh, Dying Breed, and I'm gonna give it a three. Yeah, three gang. Uh, my three favorite tracks are My Own Soul's Warning, Caution, and My God, just to copy. Uh, my least favorite track is the title track, I'm playing The Mirage, and I'm going to give it six. Nice. Rock on. I don't know. It's amazing how we had such a diverse emotional reaction to this album, and like <laughs> mostly the same ratings. Yeah, yeah like I we know. all have the same ballpark and the same songs, so like. Yeah, mm. like, yeah, I was really just sticking up for those songs that I really liked. And I, I agree, yeah. the rest of the album is not fair. Really good. Fair! 100% fair. All right, everybody, we have taken a break, and now we are back with the second half of our new release discussion this week. And joining us, a uh, podcast veteran, we have Zach, 
who joined us earlier uh, in this show's run to talk about Liturgy's The Ark Work uh, on a um, recommended album uh, segment. But now he's here to talk about a new release with us because he is the group chats that we are in. Zach is the, the bright eyes boy. He is the, the lexicon of Connor Oberst. So I would love to give the floor to him to introduce this record. Yeah, and contextualize well, uh, it as well a wee bit. Yes. Sure, sure. Uh, no problem. Uh, glad to be back. Glad to be talking about uh, Bright Eyes and Connor Oberst. He's really uh, one of the most important musicians to kind of my history as a fan of music. Uh, digital Ash and a Digital Urn, which is a 2005 Bright Eyes album, is actually the first CD that I ever purchased for myself. It's not the first CD I ever owned, but it's the first one I ever went out and bought for myself. And so like, from even an earlier point than that, I had been listening to Bright Eyes, but it's just been a, a, a project that's meant a lot to me over the years. Um, in particular, uh, so, so for anybody that doesn't know for whatever reason, uh, Bright Eyes is the, uh, uh, it's a singer songwriter, indie folk, indie pop. Uh, uh, he's alt country, covered a lot of different styles over the years. Uh, but it, it, it's it's a it's a project that that really uh, it dates back to the to the 90s to the Omaha Nebraska indie scene, and uh, it was an artist that I got into uh, in high school in the 2000s, which is like the exact right moment in your life to get into Bright Eyes, uh, because of the subject matter and the, the tone of that music. It's just something that really spoke to me as a as a young person who who loved writing. There's there's just a lot of flowery language, um, and imagery. And, and just things that, that really opened me up to the possibilities of what music could be in terms of evoking a feeling through writing and evoking a feeling through uh, vocal performance and things of that nature. Uh, Bright Eyes has been a project that's been shelved. I think their last release was in the year 2011, uh, The People's Key, which is a, a bit of a divisive album. It's certainly one that sort of landed with a dud. There are fans of it for sure, but it's really not one of the more heralded Bright Eyes releases. Um, prior to 2011, uh, Connor Roberts had kind of ventured off and started doing solo projects and there's a project called uh, like the Mystic Valley Band and there are several releases that kind of uh, fall before that final Bright Eyes project so in a way that was kind of like a, a, a return for them but it landed with such a dud that it, it kind of killed the project and no one really cared about it so here we are nine years later and there's another return uh, for the, the Bright Eyes project with this new record which is called Down in the Weeds at the end of the world. Yeah. Is that right? Something like that. The it's the where world. the world no, once the was. Yeah. That's... Where the world once was. Thank there we go. It's not Bright Eyes fan uh, butchering the name of the new album. <laughs> hey, listen, it's, you know, I love Fiona Apple, but I don't try to memorize <laughs> the poems that she titles some of her albums. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, Down I'm, in the Weeds will be the name of this from henceforward. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm wide <laughs> awake in the airplane over the sea <laughs> when the. When the Pawn was uh, fucking anyway. <laughs> yep. So this I think is... I had a minor stroke. Just then. <laughs> so this this return project, down in the weeds where the world once was, uh, is is the the first project by Bright Eyes uh, in nine years, and it's one that's received a fair amount of critical acclaim to this point. Uh, people seeing it as a return to form. Um, and I'll just start right off by saying that it's a nice album and it reminds me a lot of Casadega. You know, a lot of times these sort of um, coming back projects after a long layoff, whether it's My Bloody Valentine or Slow Dive or Swans or whoever, lots of bands do it. There is a tendency uh, from time to time for those, those projects after a long delay to kind of throw back to an earlier style. And it's sort of interesting because I would say that this one doesn't necessarily do that. This doesn't sound like a 90s Bright Eyes project or, or an early 2000s Bright Eyes project. It sounds very much like the piano-led stuff that Connor's been doing for years as a solo artist, uh, or his collaboration with Phoebe Bridgers, the Better Oblivion Community Center, or uh, Casadega, uh, which is an, an album that was released in 2007. It's one of my favorite Bright Eyes albums. That's really what the sonic palette of this album reminds me of. And that was kind of interesting because I was expecting, uh, just based on the, the reception that it had, uh, that it was going to be uh, something new and something different. And it turns out that it mostly is the same thing that he's been doing. And I don't say that in a dismissive way. I guess it was just sort of a surprise to me to come to this project and sort of find him doing uh, 
you know, it, it didn't feel like the sort of thing that would evoke that response. I don't know if anybody else felt that. Tyler, I guess you're the other person that has like a real history with Bright Eyes. Did you feel like that? Did you kind of have an expectation of what this was going to sound like? Well, I had heard that it was going to be a little bit more, um, well, like, let's say propulsive and then, then some of Connor's solo work that it was really going to kind of call back, that, that it was going to be kind of Bright Eyes returning, like with a capital R, basically. And I basically feel, I think, similar, similarly to you, I felt that it was like, not really full of surprises or like didn't really have anything that really surprised me. Uh, it, I mean, to be perfectly honest, there's not a lot here that really left much of an impression on me at all, uh, which I'm sad to say. Though there, that said, there are plenty of like good songs here that I think, um, you know, it does sound like an and feels like a Conor Oberst record. Um, but there are some good songs here. I actually really like, I believe, the lead single, One and Done, uh, I thought was a really good song. Um, but yeah, I think, and I, I can get more into it as we kind of, as this discussion kind of goes along. But for the most part, I was kind of like, this is, you know, competent stuff. Uh, it doesn't really wow me in any kind of particular way. Uh, and there are kind of points where I think that the record does drag. I think structurally, it's a bit unkempt uh, as well. Uh, I think that said, I, if I remember correctly, I think it finishes strongly. Um, with some of its best songs kind of tucked away towards the end. Oh, yeah, To Death's Heart was a really good song. I really liked that song. And um, Cal Calais to Dover as well. Calais to Dover. Was, was really song. good. So it was really good too. But I think, yeah, for the most part, it kind of just uh, blended together. I think it's kind of on me that I haven't necessarily spent uh, a lot more, more time with this record, certainly compared to the other uh, Bright Eyes records, which I pretty much all revisited in the last seven days. Um, but this, yeah, it kind of, I think, landed a bit weakly for me. Um, I don't think it's the worst thing that Connor's done. Uh, I don't, for the record, think that Connor has done anything that I would characterize as bad. Um, but he has released projects um, that I would call, you know, it, upsettingly mediocre. Um, and that would be obviously the people's key. Um, and I unfortunately would probably lump this in with that as well um, but it certainly I think has the potential to grow on me like I said there are some songs that I do quite enjoy I think Dance and Sing is also a really good song and um, I like the writing as well on songs like uh, Steer Well Song and Comet Song even if I think that instrumentally those songs are a bit more lacking um, yeah it's all right <laughs> And, and mm -hmm. the people's key was what I had on the mind what I had on my mind when I asked you that question because again just I looking strictly at the reception of others you yeah. would think that the people's key was this kind of aggressively mediocre thing which maybe you think that it is and you would think that this is sort of the return to form which i'm not i'm not like no I, <laughs> which you may think it is i'm just for the public like a person may think that it is i think it's like i think that it's decent it's and that's sort of what i think about this too and I just found that the, the, the disparity in reaction between the two records was weird because they feel mm. very similar to me. Uh, yeah. yeah well, I, the the I instrumental just... palette of this is definitely a, a bit different. It's a bit evolved. You have like mandolins. There's more piano. I think up to and including Casadega, uh, Connor wins me through the sheer strength of the songwriting alone. Um, but since then, the songwriting, I think, has kind of taken a dip. And so... A little bit anyway or at least you know he's kind of lost some of the the spark that he had kind of like in his 20s and so i think but what makes the post casadega connor music whether it's bright eyes or not what makes it work the stuff that i like is when there's a real fire to it even if it is not quite as um you know refined songwriting wise like i'm thinking of the desaparecidos album payola um that which is kind of like a that's kind of like a side project of connor's which is like kind of a raucous punk band basically like balls to the wall loud music um and it's really great that album is awesome and lots of people slept on it i think and i basically like that album more than anything post casadega that con has been involved in although i also liked um ruminations which is one of his solo albums that was much more stripped down um but again benefited from a, a kind of a more consistency uh tightness and just focus um, that that something like this lacks and and I do like this a little bit more than the people's key at least because I think that Generally the quality of the songwriting here is better. It doesn't have the lows that that album has um, But 
yeah, I just, I, I, I do struggle. Uh, and I, it's, it sucks to say this as a Bright Eyes fan, but I do struggle to find any real, you know, passion for mm. this record. Can, can I leap in? Because I think you're going to wind up taking most of my points. Yeah, please, um, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, my history with Bright Eyes is, is there, but much more um, in the background, I would say. Um, I first became aware of them um, a few years ago, basically just trawling my Spotify recommended daily playlists um when just all i was listening to was like the the back end of that will be an acoustic band i've never heard of it was a period of my life where i discovered cry wank for the first time so that should give you some context of the kind of bright eye songs that i was hearing discover um, what um, we, we we all remember our first cry wank <laughs> that is cry wank <laughs> don't we just honest, honest to god great great band they're so good um mm-hmm. They have a song called um, "Song for Guilty," mas- uh, "Song for Guilty Sadist" that is um, outstanding. Um, yeah, no, they're a great anti-folk band. Um, but yeah, um, and I went back to one of their more celebrated records recently. Um, so they are there. I've been aware of them. They have never been like a top-tier band for me. I think I just um, I've never found a way in to their mu- music that keeps me there. I suppose, um, but I always it's one of the situations where I can see the talent and the craftsmanship and I, and like why people like it and why I should like it. Um, but it just doesn't, I, I feel no compulsion to really go back to them. Um, and, and, and my experience with this record is very similar to, to what Tyler was saying, which it was, is very different to the kind of bright eyes I know. Um, I can see that there's a lot of progression I've missed out on, but I would say that, in the moment, I am intensely aware of, of the fact that this is a very, very well-constructed, well-written record with a lot of personality. Um, but I remember almost nothing about it, aside from the factual bullet points of the aesthetic. Um, and I, I, like, If you force me to listen to it again, I would not complain. Um, but as opposed to the Killers record, where I found that incredibly forgetful, but completely lacking in personality, lacking in progression here I, I i will probably not remember this record next week but i am intensely aware that it is it is well put together and it has an audience who will appreciate it yeah word yeah i think i agree uh it's it's an album that that like while it is on for its i think it's a 54 minute record and it never feels totally draggy to me it never loses my interest and then once it's over, I don't, I, I, I neither feel particularly motivated to listen to it again. And I also don't really feel inspired to go listen to other Bright Eyes projects. There's something kind of, when you listen to Fevers and Mirrors, it makes you want to listen to Lifted or it makes you want to listen to I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning. Like, cause there's just, there are very few songwriters or lyricists that do it like this. And then you listen to this record and you're like, that's a nice experience. And yeah. now I'm done with it. And the thing about those early records is that they leave an impression. Like you can't really, I think, you know, they set forget, a mood. You don't, you don't forget the experience of listening to them anytime soon, even if they don't really work for you. Like something like Fevers and Mirrors, which is basically Connor, you know, on the verge of tears, screaming at you for, for 40 or 50 minutes. Like you don't forget that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably made it sound a bit more dramatic than it is, but it's it's you know, pretty dramatic. Yeah. No. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah. He, he and, calls himself out for how dramatic it is. That's how yeah. Dramatic. Yeah. But I and I guess this is kind of he's moved and he's kind of moved past that now. He's moved into kind of like the the elder songwriter mode. Not that he's old, but like he's kind of moved into his you know later period, and it's kind of a more mm-hmm. you know refined. Um, you know, but like um, what what I would say to that is like I I talked um, earlier on the podcast about the new Matt Elliott record, and that is a record that is very evidently someone moving into sort of the later stage of their artistic trajectory, where they are being more mature and stripped back, and they're happy to let the music do more of the talking. Um, that's a record that I I am going to remember and go back to, but I don't feel I I feel like. He, uh, there is a better version of this record in the person who made it. Yeah. I also just think that as well, like topically, there's there's not a lot, you know, that's really all that gripping here as well. Like it feels, uh, there's not a lot about the songwriting that really like grabs you or like leaves an impression. There are some songs that do. Like again, Kelly and Dover, I come back to, I think is a really uh, 
great mm. song in terms of writing. Um, but I mean, I would love to have more, I guess, I don't know, maybe reflexive and, and writing about Connor kind of talking about himself a bit more or even about like the, his musical legacy a little bit. Cause I mean, there was a time, I mean, I only know about this in retrospect because I didn't really live through it, but there was a time in the early two thousands where like people were calling Connor like the next Dylan and they were calling him like all of these crazy things, but on the basis of a records like lifted where it was like, Holy shit, this kid is like, got it. Um, and, and he's kind of never really fallen off, but he has kind of been also receding from with every kind of release. He's kind of receded from that, you know, particular, the things that were eliciting those particular kind of plaudits. And so I would love to see more of Connor kind of reckoning with, with, you know, his place as a songwriter. Um, it feels very much like, you know, there's this, these, this record could have, for the most part, being being written by anybody. There are obviously certain aspects of the album, like the opening track, that are like very, um, you know, <laughs> that's a bright, a very bright eyes that thing to, op- to a open with the, of the, all the, albums. Yeah, I. The biggest thing, there there are two big takeaways for me from this album. Uh, one is that if you told me to guess what this album sounded like based on the fact that it's a bright eyes album, I I could have. This is exactly what I guessed it would sound like. Um, <laughs> yep. I don't think I don't think that's particularly a, a, a good or bad thing in this instance. That's yeah. not really a mark on quality. What is more of a mark on quality is that I was at with the advent of this being a new release from them. I was kind of hoping it would be it would finally be the record that sits me down and is like, all right, I've been kind of missing out on these guys because I've only heard I'm Wide Awake. And I do like that album quite a lot, but again, it's not something that's really inspired me to get around to their other stuff. Uh, More because it's like, I have a lot of stuff that I want to listen to, and that's that just doesn't <laughs> land high on the list for whatever reason. But I was hoping this would finally be the record that's like, all right, I, I got to do a deep dive on this band now. And... It is, uh, it is not that record. It is not the record that did that. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think it's... <laughs> I think the best way I've heard it described is the very first thing that Zach said about it quality-wise is that it's nice. It's, <laughs> it, is very, it is very nice. I, yeah. it, it, it's nice to listen to. It's nice when it's on. There are some songs I really like on it. And I was just not going to stick around in my memory much at all. No. Yeah. Which, so one of the things that I, I, I was thinking as we were starting is that if we were to talk about any other Bright Eyes album right now, any of them, from Collection of Songs, their debut, all the way to The People's Key, I could give you a dissertation on all of them because even the ones that I'm not a huge fan on, I've listened to dozens, if not hundreds of times, whereas this I've listened to four or five times now, right? Just for the sake of this conversation, I've listened to it several times. And yet, like, that's such the key thing. I, I feel like something that sort of ties a lot of Bright Eyes projects together is there's a level of, kind of as Tyler's talking about, like a metatextual looking back on a career. That's one potential thing that this album could be, but I think that that's sort of what Ruminations is, as that title sort of suggests. Payola kind of has like, a focus. There's a reason that the Desaparecidos project came back and it was because Connor was mad about immigration and politics and you know there were things that were on his mind that sort of drove that album on a conceptual level that he was clearly also emotionally invested in on for both of those two albums. And that's something that Casadega has, that's something that I'm Wide Awake It's Morning has where they just have like a driving idea behind them. And I can't, I could not tell you what the driving idea behind this album is other than to show up and play some instruments and make yeah, a I mean, indie folk album in the year just, 2020. It just feels like, like, I don't know what I expected. Mm. <laughs> That's kind of just well, the, like the end of that a, a bag, a bag, dead pigeon inside. I don't know what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just a little, a, it's not quite a dead pigeon, but... No, I know, but that's... That's, 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 that's the energy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, August, Jake, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, uh, yes, actually, I have yeah. a fair amount okay, because cool. I Please. took thorough notes because I knew if I tried to do this off of the dome, that would be near impossible. Uh, what I found was, so we've got our opener, uh, Paige Turner's Rags, which I think is pretty much emblematic of the whole project. 
right out of the gate in that there are some good ideas on it, but the construction of it is just really janky. And it's gonna make that quite, exact point. It doesn't quite come together. I mean, then we get Dance and Sing, which is a fantastic song. I mean, uh, granted, I mean, I think it, the chorus towards the, the not like, it's not like a chorus, but it's a chorus of people singing. I think that gets just a hair cheesy, but overall, I can forgive it. Uh, and now, then we go into, I think, Mariana Trench. There might be a song in Just Once in the World is between those. Okay, yeah. Uh, Mariana Trench has a pretty solid groove to it. And a lot of the songs on this album are, are typically heavily reverberated to give some sort of some eerie quality to them. But then there are other ideas across this, like on one and done where like they chipmunk the reverberated vocals and it just it's not a good idea it sounds really tacky and that's and then there's something on like the song pen and broom <laughs> where connor does this like mm, thing <laughs> and that sounds very goofy but on the other hand there's songs like uh there's like details that enhance the songs like on a uh, like the keyboards, particularly on a stairwell song, which I think yeah. really made that song so much better. And then there's some really good uh, oberst writing across this, some really clever puns that stick in my head, like uh, the uh, hearts and spades line, which I thought was a nice little pun there. Uh, and there's just... But then you've got songs like Hot Car in the Sun, which stand out for just being really cloying and kind of yeah, I kind of bad. That song has yeah, a really that... nice melody, but it doesn't really go anywhere. Which no, is no, really it doesn't. Because no, I, I like the I melody of that song. Fine. Yeah, it's just kind of... But I mean, if I want melody, I can listen to Marianne Trench, which I think has that Yeah, that, that's a good song. I do like that yeah. song, Marianne Trench. Yeah, uh, then you've got stuff like... Uh, you know, To Death's Heart and uh, Comet Song, which are good ways to, like, bring down the energy. But I feel, and this is a point that is very specific to me, having lived in uh, Omaha my whole life. He did uh, mention that, and I thought of you. And, and listening to other Bright Eyes projects, there is always something that is very distinctly Omaha to them. There's something that, there's like a line or like some piece of imagery that just, I can relate to on like a, a sensory visual level that just brings it all together for me. Where on this album, I just, I don't know, I struggle to find that same kind of distinction, that kind of personality to it. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just a little disappointing after what I've I've listened to f and enjoyed from Bright Eyes. Mm. Yeah, the point about it seems to be the really consensus. Solid. The the one album that maybe eschews that the most is like Casa Vega. It's just an album that feels like it's in Florida because it is like it's because mm. that's where it was written and that's like part of the story of it. Like it, it also has like that regional specificity quality. That's a really Yeah, no, that's, that's what I think is, is so, so impactful about Connor's stuff that it, it feel like you, if you've been there, you know what that place is. It, it, it evokes it. Yeah, the, I think the opening track on this album actually references a neighborhood where my best friend used to live, which is uh, Dundee. Uh, oh, like in the okay, little yeah. vocal opening track, they're talking about going to like the Dundee florist or something along those lines. Okay, like, I, I, know I right where that is. I, I, I do too. I, That's I, funny. God, you say Dundee, I think Scotland. Uh, that really confused me. <laughs> well, I live Nebraska in a, and Scotland, very different places. I, I live in yeah. a city yeah. which is just a bastardization of the word Dundee, which is Dunedin in New Zealand. So. Yeah, no, my flatmate for two years was from Dundee, so that might have something to do with it. But yeah, I had no idea that I was from uh, Dundee. Yeah, my friend, a lot of my friends are from Dundee, but they just live a couple blocks away. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anyway.
continuing on. Uh, yeah, Jake. Jake, do you have anything you want to add about this album? Uh, I mean, a lot's been said, and I generally can't contribute to a dissenting opinion in the slightest. I'm, I, I, I suppose maybe I could be the person here who likes it the most, but that's really not saying a whole lot. Um, just because, as Zach predicted, Casadega ended up being my favorite Bright Eyes album. It's um, a Phoebe I've, Bridgers record before Phoebe Bridgers happened. Exactly. Well, good. also because I think if Morgan <laughs> is looking for the Bright Eyes album that will hook him, it's Casadega purely 100%. because that album is like, it, in sound at least, it's like alt country. It sounds like Rustin Kelly. It sounds like Phoebe it's Bridgers. Alt, alt country it's, meeting piano rock. Yeah, exactly. And I love the vibe that that has to Casadega. It gives that album a a life and a swing that is so distinct from the other records. Like you have Lifted, which is this really acoustic ballad heavy album. And then you have Fevers and Mirrors, which is like a bit more like adventurous, I guess, in terms of, of production. Emo. Borderline. It's emo. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's emo folk. Fevers and Mirrors. When I was listening to that album, I was just like, the biggest vibe I get on this album is brand new. And that yeah. was really bizarre. 100%. But it, it's like, around the same era. Yeah, and you can totally tell. It's just like, this sounds exactly like Deja Entendu. Like, mm -hmm. so wildly which, well, it doesn't sound exactly like Deja Entendu. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I get what you mean. Sorry, which, you know what which, I mean. Which album is this again? Fevers and Mirrors. Yeah, Fevers and Mirrors. Um, which, which is a, a really good album. That was my favorite until Casadega. Um, but I think that everybody's been pretty on point in saying that all of the albums that I've listened to so far, they do have a very distinct identity. And it feels like this album is a lot of middle grounds of other albums that just don't take anything like far enough to earn its identity. I think that Connor's songwriting is good, as it always is. He is a phenomenal writer. That is what carries most of his work uh forward just because he's he's very he's, he's a very good songwriter and even at his worst moments he's still compelling for one reason or another and that's mostly the case here but it's less specific it's a bit more general like it just seems to be sort of this midway point between fevers and mirrors and casadega except it inhabits none of the niches that would make me recommend like that those albums to somebody like Casadega is an album that has an identity that allows me to recommend it to someone like Morgan, which this doesn't really have. And I also just think it has like, each Bright Eyes record is structured more or less the same. They're all, they all have kind of the same like length and, and track list numbers. And they all begin with sort of a similar like weirder spoken word slash like sampled something or other. And like this kind of this intro track just does like nothing for me like at all and i was already kind of tepid on the intro tracks of uh, other albums save for like uh claire audience which i think that's the best one because it's a compelling like idea that sets the tone but it also is songful like it breaks out into a a melody and song whereas this is just like yeah okay, I don't really know what mood this is supposed to be setting. And then it just sort of goes off into a song and it's like, oh, okay. And like Morgan said, it's nice when you're listening to it, when you're paying attention to the lyrics, it's like, wow, this is, you know, it's well-written, it's well-structured, it sounds nice. Connor's vocal performances are as energized and as passionate as they usually are. But again, they're not as like, they're not as vulnerable as they are on Lifted, and they're not as like manic as they are on Fevers and Mirrors. And it just sort of occupies a really weird middle ground that feels unfortunate because it's like, this is a quality release. It's just that it's good by merit of fundamentals and fundamentals only. It's that's a like really great way of putting things, it, actually. That's a really fantastic that's, way basically my thesis statement for the album it's that like everything that makes this record good is something that makes all music good <laughs> it doesn't really have things that make bright eyes albums great. i mean look, look look all music is a fine publication but i don't know if um <laughs> it has the quality to make this album hey good. but i i do <laughs> like it from like from front to back i don't think there is a song that on, on here like even songs like hot car in the sun or persona non grata where it's like they have moments of good and moments of just sort of trailing off and it's like i think they're 
they're they're enjoyable they because there isn't a wide level of separation in quality between this album's best songs and its worst songs which speaks to its consistency and also speaks to the fact that none of it feels that special Mm. it it never consistent but not like it is consistent it is good but it is never exceptional it is never blowing me away it is never impressing me by the standards of this band so i mean i feel like the best way to describe it is just it's bright eyes going through the motions but that just means it's good yeah it's it's good motions they are good it's just if you look at the personnel more like this album has something like 40 musicians on it it's it's a really like so you have the other two members of the band mike mojas and Nathaniel Walcott. But then you look at the list, like um, I have the page open right now. I mean, it's, it's a ton of people. And instrumentally, this album is wonderful. Everybody's yeah. doing exactly what, no one's out of tune. You know, all of the melodies are, are nice. They're, they're, they're nice to listen to. But I, that's, I, it, it, I hate to be the uh, tourist in the room, but it lacks a direction. It lacks a, this is what we're going well, for. you're right. It needs and I mean, like it's, a, particu- it's particularly glaring when every other Bright Eyes record has that. Yeah. Yes, and, exactly. And, well, and we're in the year of Punisher, which is... In the year of our Lord Phoebe, Punisher. The year of our Lord Phoebe Bridgers, Phoebe. Uh, Connor Roberts' <laughs> collaborator, who is weirdly the only person in music that is not on this album somehow. I don't... <laughs> yeah, that, that was that. like... Where's shock, the Phoebe? Like, Connor like, Roberts Connor was all on over Punisher. Punisher. So... All over <laughs> Yeah. Where's Phoebe, man? Like, I can hear him distinctly on songs like Halloween and then on this the record, I'm just like, track. not Phoebe, like, once? Really? And this just doesn't have the same... Im- not, I, I know that August isn't the biggest fan, but I think everybody else that's on this call right now has a really deep emotional reaction to the everything happening yes. there. And they're not yes. wildly different, you know? It's just... No. And, and I think that... What the, are you talking the, about? What, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> But yeah. uh, it, it never really feels like big and full, like the kind of thing that would have 40 musicians either, which, which would be, you know, another type of thing. It's maybe it's not as emotional, but it's big and it's grandiose. And it never really feels like that either. It's just sort like, of Lifted is an acoustic heavy album that sounds bigger than this. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I don't the understand how that's that, possible. To be fair, is like sensationally good. Yeah, it's great. It's probably no, the mean, best sounding Bright Eyes album. Lifted, sound, lifted is an album where like, I, I play it in my car and I feel like I still need like a school bus's worth to house just how big that album is. Mm, the yeah, waste of paint exactly. of it all. Yeah. Ooh. All right, let's not shit ourselves here and let's just... Yeah, let's... <laughs> yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> I understood that reference. <laughs> I, I got it. Yeah. Anyways, okay. yeah. Um, like the favorites, song. These favorites. Well, all I just want to say as a summary, just to sum this whole thing up, uh, how I would sum this up in one sentence is I really enjoyed this week getting to listen to the previous albums of Bright Eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Preparing, yeah. preparing for this excuse. was great. Like, I discovered, yeah. uh, like, I love mm-hmm. Fevers and Mirrors a lot. I think Lifted is great. And I think, like, Casadega is joining the upper echelons of my favorite albums. So it was totally mm-hmm. worth it. I mean, it. I, uh, I, I listened to uh, Digital Ash and a Digital Earn. And that, that's grown on me significantly. And, and well, I listen to music. Perfect. Okay. Implying All that right. Bright Eyes is not music. Let's, let's start with <laughs> Zach, I think. I think yeah. we should start yeah. with Zach. What are, three what are your favorite three favorite, favorite tracks? Favorite favorite track. favorite okay, existence. so three favorite tracks. There, there, are, there are two that really stood out. One of them is To Death's Heart and Three Parts. Mm-hmm. And I would say that Stairwell song is another. Uh, I just, I'm just a big fan of mandolins. Uh, and I think third, this is gonna this is gonna sound a little weird, but I really like one and done, which shares like a melodic yeah. progression with Lime Tree, the closer oh, right. to yeah. Sega. Lime and Tree is so good. Yeah, and oh just any anytime you can do that in folk music, Phil Elverum, I feel really good. I love reprises <laughs> like that. I love things that make me feel. You know, uh, when you're listening Daddy to Phil. a project of a band that's been around for this long, and you've been listening to them for a long time. Those little throwbacks and homages, like really sort of you feel the weight of the history of the band uh, which is something that i think this album could use a lot more of my least favorite track is probably persona non grata which is not a bad song again there's not a huge level of separation i think like to death's heart is probably the only song on the on this record that i'm likely to like ever think about outside the context of like oh maybe i'll try this and it'll hit differently today but to death's heart's really the only memorable song on here to me 
Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, mm -hmm. If you need a score, I, I think I would give it like a diet six. A diet I mean, six. Yeah, like lean, diet six. Kind of, you know, uh, diet six sig. is looking shabby. You know, diet. like it's good, but it's good, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So we'll go in reverse order, shall we? That uh, sounds good. Indeed, that was the implication. Yes. Uh, so uh, my uh, three favorite tracks are, um, one and done. Ooh, Mariana Trench and Calais to Dover. Uh, my least favorite track is probably Pan and Broom. And I'm going to give this a hearty 5.5. Wow. Oof. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that, oh that's me. It's that me. Das okay. ist you. Yeah, das ist mich. Um, so, uh, meine drei Lebenstracks um, were. Just once in the world, <laughs> I have a GCSE in German. I'm sorry. Um, just once in the world, hot car in the sun, Calais to Dover, and I, my least favorite is Page Turner's Rag, I suppose. And I'm going to give it a six and a half. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my, I'm in complete agreement with uh, with Zach regarding. Uh, What's that song? Damn it. The one about death. <laughs> to death's heart in three parts? Yes, that one. That's a great song, even if I have dementia and can't remember the title. Um, You're not the only one on this podcast. I, I'm, I think we I all messed do. up the title of the album before we started. To just, yeah, I, th I think we all do to varying what, what extents. They don't, the viewers don't know is that we are all just in different rooms of a nursing home. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it's all just... Uh, it's all just a facade. This podcast is essentially us exercising out our traumas. Our cry for help. Literally yes. this whole podcast, if you're watching it, you are in Shutter Island and we are all... <laughs> I, was just thinking, I was just thinking of Shutter Island right before you said that. Anyways, uh, Morgan. The crazy yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, to, to death's heart and three farts. Uh, <laughs> fucking uh, Cal, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you expected i have no idea uh fucking uh calculated over <laughs> and uh oh, no. uh mariana trench and my least favorite is hot car in the sun and uh six and a half out of ten all right so favorites were uh to death's heart i don't think i mentioned it but uh Forced Convalescence, which I, I do like, like the one as yeah. well. Good song. And uh, hmm, I guess I'll go Dance and Sing. Least favorite would probably be uh, Hot Car in the Sun, and I am in agreement with Tyler with like a, a 5.5. And it, it, it really gets the extra points for me because I like Connor's other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so you're giving it a five and a half? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's Jack the Knee. Yep. Uh, my three favorite tracks are Calais to Dover. Um, Calais to Dover stairwell song, and I'll say, I'll say Comet song too. I like that song a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and least favorite, I'll say Persona non grata, and I will give it a a, 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 a decent six. Nice. You know that song, Mariana Trench? I just think that song's really deep, you know? Um, that's the attraction I'm, of that song. I, I swear to God. I <laughs> swear to God, one of you's gonna... I'm gonna kill one of you. <laughs> well, well uh, come yeah, over here, just so I can see your fucking face and say hi. I'll that's do it! Yes. Before, before any of that happens, I'm going to kill August. I know who you are. You just, I, I know and August we, is like I've been waiting. We, it's like we don't, kill list. We don't. <laughs> we we don't. We don't know well, why like, yet. Before they kill them. <laughs> we don't know why I'm going to do it yet, but it's kind of a foregone conclusion. I, I mean, I think point. we know why you're you're gonna do it. Okay. Mm. So this Bright Eyes album, unanimity basically. Yeah. People reviewing it and all ratings between five point five and six point five. I know. I know. <laughs> That's, 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 you know, that's consensus. Is so that the first time to, this has happened? 
Maybe. But we've had like such um, a strong consensus. Hang on, hang on. Uh, yeah, it's our I lowest, think so. It, it, it's our lowest standard deviation yet. Oh, well, yep, there we that's, go. that's the case. Yeah. The, the closest is the, that all of us did uh, off side from Zach, obviously, is the Boris album, which is very similarly unanimous. Yep. Yeah. Yes, anyway, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you to Zach for joining us for this review. Yes. Thank absolutely. you to our viewers for tuning in to our main episode. Now is the time where you clickety click over to see a record club review uh, of uh, the Rolling Stones Exile on Main Street absolutely. and Liz Fears Exile in Guyville. But which before, is a, you, before you do that, do you have anything you want to plug before you go, Zach? Uh, so the only thing that I'm currently working on uh, at this time is I'm actually working on a series of essays uh, that sort of detail my 15 favorite films. Uh, I've started working on that. So they're going to be essays that are just published on like a Medium blog. So it's just something that I'm doing kind of personally for fun. But it's a, it's a project that I've, I've wanted to do for a long time because they're movies that I love. They're things that mean a lot to me that I've never taken the time to write for myself to, to express... <laughs> Uh, all the different things that make them interesting and, and stuff like that. And so it's a little bit of a challenge because, you know, so many different people get to kind of participate in the conversation, which is, I don't know, what I like to do about art because art makes me think and feel a lot of things that I like to share with people. So that's it. That's what I have. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Thank you. Again, really us once again. Um, yes. And, and without... Oh, well, we should probably shout out what we're reviewing next week on the main episode. Oh, yeah, we yeah, yeah. Um, So next week on our main episode, we are reviewing uh, Rustin. Oh, we've already kind of alluded to Rustin Kelly's new album, Shape and Destroy. Shape and Destroy. And we will also be reviewing uh, Nas's new album, King's Disease. Which we also um, alluded to. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yep. And we'll see how many jokes we can get out of that album title. And um, Plenty. And we'll also be... <laughs> discussing more briefly but we will give some time as well to angel olsen's new record whole new mess uh as we mm-hmm. extra but uh very and jake and morgan themed episode next week yes exactly yeah. and and yeah and our record Including, club review uh, Nas. yes no and then our record club review next week will be i believe a morgan core uh pick um thrice's visu i don't know how to say it Vaisu. i think that's it well i think it's i think Vaisu. it's Vaisu. oh yeah. no it's good. <laughs> Descent no. already. It's going to be a <laughs> meltdown. Okay. Oh boy. Uh, but so, yeah, go and go and watch always. our record club, club review. And yeah, as always, rock over London. Rock over London. Rock, rock on, on Chicago. Chicago. America runs on Dunkin' Donuts.